Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are in the world. On behalf of USAID, Feed the Future, and AgriLinks, I welcome you to our webinar, Private Sector Impacts on Food Security and Nutrition, Examples from Bangladesh and Rwanda. I am Michael Saltz with AgriLinks, and before we begin, I want to orient you to the BlueJeans platform. On the right side of your screen, you'll see most of your controls. First, please use the chat to introduce yourself and network with colleagues from around the world. To ask questions, please use the Q&A button on the bottom right. Please indicate who your question is for and feel free to upvote questions you want answered. You can ask questions throughout the webinar and our Q&A session will be at the end of the event. If the presentation is too small on your screen, you can use the slide bar at the bottom of the window to adjust your view. Lastly, we are recording this webinar and we'll email you the post-event resources as soon as they are available. You can also find the resources at agrilinks.org when they are ready. Thank you so much for your attention. I will now pass it to USAID's A.D. Garcia. Thanks, Michael. And yes, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for joining our webinar. Um, and thanks for AgriLinks and MarketLinks. These two teams are co-hosting this extremely important discussion. So I just wanted to introduce myself before turning the table over to our presenters. So my name is Katie Garcia, and I am the Deputy Executive Director of the USAID's Private Sector Engagement Hub. Our role is to create the institutional conditions and operating infrastructure within USAID necessary to implement the vision outlined in the PSC policy. The policy, as many of you know, was launched nearly four years ago, and it's our agency-wide call to action and our mandate to work hand-in-hand -hand with the private sector to design and deliver our development and humanitarian programs across all sectors. As noted recently by Administrator Power, the agency needs to adapt its systems, processes, and procedures to support full engagement with the private sector. In particular, we must upgrade our hiring, data, relationship management, professional development, and procurement systems to engage the private sector at scale. In essence, USA wasn't built to do this, so now we need to build some systems to do so. So given the hub's position in the agency, we are uniquely situated to tackle these systemic constraints and lead the development of critical new systems, tools, and agency-wide change initiatives. This in turn helps missions and bureaus and our implementing partners engage the private sector at scale to achieve development outcomes. We will soon hear two exciting examples. I am glad to be the moderator for today. There are a lot of familiar names in the attendee list with whom I've worked with over the years. And so it's really nice to see all of you again here today. So in today's webinar, our three speakers will share promising practices for engaging in the private sector to advance and sustain agricultural-led economic growth and a well-nourished population, especially among women and children. First, we will have Keith Doko, the Senior Private Sector Engagement Specialist and PSC Secretariat Lead at USAID's Bureau for Res Resilience and Food Security, who will provide an overview of how the private sector can supplement public sector interventions in agriculture. Unfortunately, Keith can't join us in person as he is traveling for work, but we will play a pre-recorded presentation from him instead. Second, we will have Dr. Dennis Karamuzi, who is the chief of party for the Feed the Future Rwanda Aurora Posse activities. Dr. Karamuzi will discuss the activities work with abattoirs and butchers to tap into opportunities to both start and scale investments that increase access to animal source foods, including pork, fish, and chicken cuts. He will provide examples of co-investment grants that helped companies produce appropriately sized products with efforts to increase promotional messages through village nutrition schools and social change platforms, such as interactive voice response messaging and tailored radio programs. Our third presenter will be Dr. Ashwak Inaitula, who is the Deputy Chief of Party for the Feed the Future Bangladesh Nutrition Activity. He will discuss how partnering with social enterprises has added clean drinking water options for people in rural Bangladesh, where many sources are contaminated. Clean water is a key factor in improving and maintaining nutritional health, particularly for young children. He will explain the activities engagement process, including landscape assessments, social behavior, behavior change campaigns, and grants to mitigate risk as well as lessons learned about consumer experience and targeted marketing. So after the three speakers presentations around 10.30 a.m., we will open the Q&A session. If you have questions uh, throughout their presentations, please do feel free to type them into the chat box during their 
their presentations, and then we have a team that will be working to collect those um, uh, and pull them all together and address them during the Q&A session. Our speakers may also be able to respond to you directly in the chat box, depending on the type of question. So with that, um, we'd like to welcome Keith as our first speaker. So Michael, please start his recording. Hi, good morning, afternoon, and evening. Thank you for joining our AgriLinks webinar on private sector impacts on food security and nutrition. I'm Keith Dacco, the Private Sector Engagement Secretariat Lead in USAID's Bureau for Resilience and Food Security. And it's my pleasure to join you all and give you a brief introductory presentation on how the private sector can supplement public sector interventions in agriculture. Let's start by reviewing some numbers. Feed the Future has contributed to 23.4 million more people living free from poverty and 3.4 million more children living free from stunting in the areas where we work. The impact of Feed the Future can't be achieved without significant contributions from the private sector. I'd like to touch on how USAID collaborates with private sector partners in the three areas of work that are central to this initiative. First, USAID engages the private sector to invest in research. Feed the Future has a robust research agenda, investing in innovations that are critical to the future of food systems and have commercial potential for smallholder farmers and agribusinesses in developing countries. In Nigeria, our partnership with Bayer has achieved a major milestone, the release of Podbor resistant cowpea, which is a variety that provides protection against this devastating pest. This engagement has also helped build technical and business capacity of local African breeding programs and small and medium-sized enterprises. <clears throat> the success of our research depends on getting innovations and information out at scale. This requires strong collaboration with the private sector to commercialize technologies and make them accessible to smallholder farmers and entrepreneurs. USAID also engages the private sector to support smallholder farmers to increase agricultural production. USAID works closely with the private sector to maximize research investments and increase farmer productivity and incomes. We aim to ensure our work expressly supports those who have historically lacked access to much needed inputs and other types of support in an effort to promote equity within the food system. Recently, we partnered with PepsiCo to demonstrate that investing in women in the company's local supply chains through improving access to critical inputs and skills can lead to greater growth, profitability, and sustainability. Together, the partnership will deliver evidence-based models, new on-farm approaches, and data and insights to make a practical and compelling business case for scaling investments in women's economic empowerment within PepsiCo and other global companies. Another critical component of our efforts is engaging the private sector to ensure smallholder farmers can access the finance they need. We work with partner organizations to connect risk-averse lenders with borrowers, including smallholder farmers. In particular, we are working to close the finance gap for women and young farmers and entrepreneurs who face unique barriers to financing. We are aiming to launch a new first-of-its-kind venture in early 2023, the Nutritious Food Financing Facility, or N3F. This mechanism will mobilize funds to increase lending to SMEs in Africa that focus on increasing the availability and affordability of safe, nutritious foods for local consumers. The NF3 is, or N3F, excuse me, is a top priority for USAID because of its private sector engagement and nutrition impact. It is also a strong response to the food crisis triggered by Russia's war against Ukraine. 
We see the business community as a key partner and vital to the agricultural transformation needed to sustainably reduce poverty and hunger around the world. Engaging the private sector will continue to be our priority. Thank you all for having me in this important discussion and I'll turn it back over to our moderator. Thank you. Great, thanks so much to Keith for his overview presentation. Now we'd like to turn to Dennis for his presentation on the Feed the Future Rwanda Aurora Wahazi activity. Over to you, Dennis. Yeah, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, and I'm very pleased today to present to you our activity, uh, which is the Feed the Future Rwanda Aurora Wahazi. Uh, we are quite a recent activity uh, which was awarded in 2019 uh, in October and uh, we have big goal to sustainably increase access to availability and consumption of animal source foods through the development of a profitable market and uh, to achieve that we are working across uh, eight districts here in Rwanda uh, and uh, for each of the eight districts we make an effort to identify rural enterprises that are strategically placed uh, to facilitate the achievement of that uh, broad goal. Next slide please. So in order to achieve that, uh, we started out by trying to understand this important animal source foods market. Uh, in our case, we are working across uh, four value chains, pigs, fish, chicken, and small ruminants. And each of those markets can be unique, and you can move to the next slide. And uh, in its uniqueness, uh, each value chain has certain aspects that have or we have built around the nature or the structure of that market to determine what we call a set of interventions. On your left side is a number of interventions, three of them that speak to the fact that we would like to develop or, or the development of uh, support the development of uh, the value chains in the private sector. And we have identified three key interventions one around uh, animal source foods production, uh, facilitating end market access, and facilitating financial services access. Uh, to your right, we have another three interventions that focus on the nutrition messaging, or for that matter, extension development. And we also have a focus on animal source product market. And this is going to be the theme or the focus of our conversation for today. Uh, but we also have a focus on women's empowerment. Each of these interventions uh, is tailored to work towards a set of activities that help us to achieve the goal. In the first set, uh, which I spoke about strengthening or developing the value chains that I spoke about, we identify private sector that are positioned more or less to push the supply side. On your right side, the set of interventions that speak more to the consumption or at least increasing demand for animal source foods. Across the animal source foods market, there's several things we have got to do and that we have identified as we go into the implementation from production through processing, retail, and eventually achieving household consumption. And that includes a set of what we consider supporting functions that are quite a number, as well as a set of what we consider rules and regulations that support the achievement of that bigger goal. Now, this is a market systems activity, and by design or by default, we are tailored to support the private sector towards the achievement of this big goal of Aurora Wehazi. Next slide, please. So, uh, as I spoke about the different interventions, uh, today I would like to focus on the intervention that speaks to animal source food product development or the product market. 
uh, in this case, we develop a vision for each intervention. And in the animal source foods market, we have tailored our vision first to look at the larger uh, scale kind of uh, actors who are the market processors. But on the other end, we also look at the retailers who largely are responsible for driving consumption at the community level. Uh, at the larger market processor level, we are looking to expand the reach uh, of these animal source food processors, and these include abattoirs, slaughterhouses, butchers, and uh, these are largely uh, based in the rural uh, communities, and we work to strengthen their capacity to process and therefore be in a position to meet uh, local demand. On the retailer side, we work to transform how these retailers are able to sell the products uh, to consumers, really looking at aspects of uh, product marketing, hygiene, packaging, all of that which works to improve affordability. Uh, in the context of Rwanda, uh, many Rwandans appreciate the value of animal source foods. Uh, however, there are always uh, limiting factors uh, that deter people from consumption of animal source foods. Uh, the understanding that these factors need to be addressed for us to achieve an increased consumption is critical. And these are aspects of availability of the product in the rural community so that they are closer to where people are able to purchase the cost of the products. You know, there's always the aspect of uh, the relative cost of animal source foods in comparison to other foods. And uh, I think to an extent, the perceptions of the consumers. We work to address some of these, working with these particular market actors. Next slide, please. Now, uh, as I said, we are a market uh, system development activity, and therefore uh, we work with the market actors to generally adopt business practices to reach target populations. Uh, in our case, it's largely rural in the eight districts that are most malnourished, that we have also determined that there is a stunting rate of upwards of 33% across these eight districts. Uh, now, this is quite different in the uh, urban areas where you would have an average of about 20% stunting rate of children under five. So in speaking and working with the private sector, we are looking for partners uh, to work towards testing smaller, more affordable products. Uh, we are also trying to help them to build a business case for a continued presence in these communities. And the example that I'll provide later on is really one of those cases that we identify a locally based uh, rural community business and work with them in their means uh, with the support of USAID to get to the extent that they can reach more communities. Next, please. So the case of Gifileo, uh, Gifileo uh, Limited is a small uh, rural-based uh, business that is focused initially have been a producer of chicken uh, broilers. And we have worked with them to develop a model that works between the producers and as an element of collection of their produce and processes this. In other words, they slaughter, they package, and deliver to different markets, including the rural households in the immediate proximity. And beyond that, they work with retailers, restaurants, and bars. Each of these different actors in the market have a role, have certain perceptions, and Gifileo as an entity have to work to understand these perceptions and work to satisfy the market. Now, they have a benefit in this. For the service they provide, they get a pay. And it will work from collection of the chickens through the processing of the chickens, the sale of the chickens. So they provide a service. And in return, the other actors pay, pay, pay for the service. Next slide, please. Next, please. Play it out, the full slide. So in order to achieve this kind of change, we understand that an actor like Gifileo 
does not stand alone in the market. There are several other uh, potential small businesses that together we are able to prove the case. We are able to test the model and we are able to develop a level that takes us to scale by mobilizing second movers and working towards a broader group adopting these new business practices. So we have Gifileo and a set of other actors across different districts, as you see on the left side, where you see the little box that has several other partners. So we understand that working across different actors, we are able to generate a significant amount of information or of knowledge that is able to prove a business case. That said, we have the factor around an enabling environment that is critical uh, for us to be able to achieve to the extent possible. And so we work with equipment process, equipment, pro equipment suppliers, we work with the regulatory organization, the Rwanda Inspectorate of Competitiveness and Consumer Protection, RICA, and we also work to provide research information that informs the business about the consumer preference. So we are fully aware that the market actor does not stand alone to influence the nature of this change to be able to deliver a low cost product. So we work around different actors, all working together to create the level of, of adoption and to be able to produce a product that serves the market, including women, youth, and people with disabilities. Next slide, please. So, as I said, uh, to achieve system change, there's a number of uh, supporting factors. In this case, we are working uh, with the, the regulatory organization, RICA, which I mentioned earlier, to develop quality and regulatory requirements and work with the entities, the different businesses, to achieve the same. We have also linked them up with equipment suppliers, and as a market, uh, we understand that this too has the potential to grow. As I said as well, market research is important because unless the market actors are able to understand the consumer preferences, they will always struggle. So we work with the, our market actors to generate the basic market information that speaks to their packaging and the appropriateness of the product. Next slide. Now, there are certain incentives we have deployed uh, to ensure that uh, the market actors we work with are able to move in the right direction. We have deployed a set of technical assistance that support them to improve their business performance. We have deployed some small grants that together with the local available financial solutions, they're able to increase their level of investment. We have also deployed, as I said earlier, uh, some analysis of demand to the extent that the business is fully aware of the opportunity in the local market to serve those various categories. There's a strong component of social behavior change and communications. As I said earlier, we understand that uh, perceptions, uh, norms, religions, and beliefs can have a factor in people's choice. So we are fully aware and have partnered with various entities to address the issues of perceptions and speak to the households on the desired change for increased consumption of animal source foods. Next, please. I will play, I'll ask uh, the organizers to play a video, uh, which will be my last slide. And that video is a case of Gifileo, who I spoke about, based out of Butsiro district. Company at Tanje Yorora in Moko, Maka, you in a Chimagatano, you won't see what you in a Makuya and a Kaviri to cover to what in Jim with the Korwa Chukuaga in Moko to the Jesaku Tura Je, Chane Chane, Aomu Karere Karutsiro, Aho, you won't see to Jeze Kubiro Magana in Gibzinyama, Kandi Duteganya Kubzonjera Dukurije. Uburyo abakiriya bagenda biyongera. Rora wiyaze yamfashije mu bijyanye n'amahugurwa yo kongera ubumenyi mu bijyanye n'ubworozi bw'inkoko ndetse n'uburyo twakongerera agaciro umusaruro ukomoka ku nkoko harimo 
nibikoresho byo mwibagiro harimo amafirigo harimo mashini zipfura mashini zikata ndetse ni modoka yo gutwara inyama kugira ngo tuzigeze ku baturage nta kibazo zigize icyo byafashije business yange yaragutse abakiriya bariyongera isoko ribarinini kubera ko dukata mu dupande dutoya n'umuturage ukeneye irobo rya 1750 arabibona kandi nanone nabaturage bororaga baburaga ho bazigemura uyu munsi turabagurira hamwe nibyo ngivyo rero gasanga twese turimo tubyungukiramo guhaya nyama hano kwa Jifreo nyama zimoko ubunganje narenje kugura inusu mafaranga cyatanu mbere twajya gatugura inyama ziduhenze zimoko bigasaba kuba wagura inkoko yose ariko Jifreo yatubereye igisubizo ko yazanye bagiro hafi ubu ngo binyamiza bizo zose keneye urazibona duhereye kwirobo kuzamura dara dufashije ko dusubiye tugira inyama zimoko mu buryo butworoheye kandi umunogeye buri muturage wese Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dennis. Um, so now we would like to welcome Ashfaq for his presentation on the Feed the Future Bangladesh Nutrition Activity. Over to you, Ashfaq. Thank you so much. Uh, welcome everyone to our presentation on uh, catering private sector solutions for food security and nutrition. Uh, my name is Ashwak Nantullah. I'm working in Feed the Future Bangladesh Nutrition Activity, uh, which is being implemented by APT Associates. Next slide, please. Uh, in our presentation today, we will start with the background of Bangladesh Nutrition Activity. We will look at the major constraints that hinder access to safe drinking water for rural households. We will learn about BNA's partnership with a private sector company to promote uh, safe drinking water. And uh, we will look at uh, what were the results of the pilot, what were our learnings, and uh, what is the way forward. Next slide. Now, BNA is a nutrition sensitive project. Our goal is to improve the health and nutritional status of rural households. Uh, we are doing this by addressing behaviors and practices related to food consumption, safe drinking water, sanitation, and hygiene. Our target beneficiaries are women in reproductive age, adolescent boys and girls, and children under five. And we are currently implementing in seven districts in the south and southeast regions of the country. Next slide. So to achieve our objective, uh, we are working in three different result areas. Uh, under result area one, we are working to increase access and consumption. <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, access and consumption um, to nutritious food through rural markets as well as through homestead farming. Under results area two, we are empowering women and adolescents uh, to improve their motivation, ability, uh, opportunities for adopting diverse nutritious diet, wash behaviors, and practices. And under results three, we are improving demand and supply of water, sanitation, and hygiene solutions to rural communities. Next slide. So uh, we are a market systems development project uh, focusing heavily on social behavioral change. Uh, in all the three areas just mentioned, uh, we are working with private sector companies and we are collaborating with the government to capacitate and facilitate a very wide range of rural market actors to take products and services to rural households. Uh, products and services which lead to improve health and nutrition. Next slide. So in, through this process, we are 
working with agricultural input companies who are promoting diverse nutritious diet and uh, good homestead farming practices to rural households. Uh, we are working with wash companies who are promoting safe drinking water, sanitation and hygiene product to rural consumers. And we are also working with relevant government departments in different result areas. Uh, uh, we are collaborating them uh, such as government departments, such as uh, Department of uh, Education, Health and Nutrition, Department of Agriculture, Religious Affairs. Uh, next slide, please. Now, uh, before we get into the private sector-led solution we are presenting today uh, on safe drinking water, let's look at the overall market constraints uh, when it comes to access to safe drinking water for rural households. What we see that is large percentage of rural households do not have access to safely managed water services. 82% uh, of the water uh, consumed by rural households have E. coli. Uh, and in addition to that, uh, microbial contamination, iron contamination, arsenic, salinity uh, are also major issues when it comes to drinking water in rural areas. Uh, households also have limited knowledge uh, of proper practices uh, of treat treating their drinking water. And there's also limited availability of affordable uh, market solutions uh, for tre treating drinking water. Next slide. So in order to address these constraints, uh, we are partnering with uh, private companies uh, to enable access to safe drinking water through three type of solutions, point of use uh, solutions, local water treatment facilities, uh, as well as uh, improvements in the most widely used uh, source of, for water, which are t wells and boreholes. And in today's presentation, we will be specifically focusing on a point of use uh, solution for safe drinking water. Next slide. And this solution uh, we are presenting today is uh, from a company called Polia Water. Uh, Folia is a U.S.-based company. Uh, they have uh, they are they have started to operate in Bangladesh uh, since uh, 2020. Uh, they are marketing a product, uh, a water a paper filter, which is basically uh, 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 an antimicrobial uh, paper filter containing uh, silver nanoparticles that removes uh, iron and uh, kills bacteria and parasites. Uh, the, Let's uh, move on to the next slides to look at the detailed features. Yeah. So uh, the paper, paper filter costs only 20 cents. Uh, it, uh, it can filter 20 liters of water. Uh, it fits into a funnel, which is uh, then placed in, uh, on, the, on the neck or top of the water jug. And water is poured through, through the lid and it takes about uh, one hour to filter three to four liters of water. And uh, as mentioned, it uh, removes uh, bacteria, iron, and uh, parasites uh, from water. Next slide, please. So our uh, partnership with Folia Water uh, was aimed to uh, facilitate the company uh, to expand its market into rural areas. Uh, we started with a survey of the rural market uh, with our support. Uh, uh, so Folia uh, we helped Folia to understand uh, the consumer perception and behaviors regarding safe drinking water and the willingness to purchase such a product uh, by the rural consumers. Uh, retailers were also surveyed to uh, identify their interest uh, of selling such a product from their stores and what were the requirements of uh, selling such a product through retail chain. So once uh, the survey was done, uh, we jointly developed a rural marketing strategy with Folia Waters, and we designed a marketing com campaign, a social behavioral change and demand generation campaign for the Folia filters. Uh, Folia onboarded retailers, uh, set up their distribution and retail network. They trained the retailers on uh, the product features, what would be the sales pitch to potential customers, uh, the health, nutrition, and economic benefits of using such a product. 
And uh, afterwards, uh, the awareness or demand generation campaign was rolled out. And uh, the campaign used courtyard sessions, uh, extensitized rural households on the adverse impacts of consuming unsafe water and demonstrated key features uh, and benefits of the polio water filter. And the, in, in addition to uh, targeting rural communities, the campaign also covered uh, market centers and uh, sharing behavioral change messages, demonstrating the, uh, the features and the use of the product to uh, all the people who were reached through the campaign. Next slide. So in terms of impact, uh, after the pilot, uh, we saw that uh, 13,000 households uh, have benefited from the polio water filters. And uh, the, our collaboration also enabled to uh, enable Folia to expand its market to two additional districts. So now the, the product is available in three, three districts. Uh, and at the same time, we also had some uh, crucial learnings uh, from this pilot. Uh, what we observed was that uh, uh, microbial uh, contamination, it's not, there's, a, there's very little understanding among consumers, rural consumers, about the impacts of microbial contamin uh, uh, contamination in their water. And uh, as such, uh, unlike iron contamination, uh, microbial contamination does not impact the taste or look of the water. So it does not really convince the consumers to keep on purchasing a, a, a water filter to filter their uh, household water, drinking water. Uh, what we also saw that uh, there is a drop in repeat purchase after three to four weeks. Uh, consumers, the initial uptake is very good. 60% um, of the consumers which do purchase the, the product. Uh, and this is a product that uh, filters 20 liters of water. So on average, uh, a, a typical household would require two to three filters. So initially the sales is quite good, but after three to four weeks, uh, the sales uh, goes down. And uh, our market observations, uh, post uh, pilot uh, observations also indicated that uh, consumers perceive the cost, the long-term cost to be high. Uh, they're okay with the initial cost of 20 cents, but uh, the long-term cost of purchasing, you know, two to three filters every day, and then, you know, on a, on a monthly basis, uh, they are perceiving the cost to be uh, high. So uh, uh, what are the way forward? Uh, if we move on to the next slide. Right. So uh, what we realized that uh, microbial, uh, that the main features of the filter, uh, that it's uh, filtering microbial contamination, iron and, and uh, bacteria and parasites, uh, only with the iron, uh, addressing iron contamination, there is a, there is a uh, you know, big difference uh, in, in the taste of the water. Uh, some, uh, so uh, the sensory, it provides a sensory cue uh, to the consumers that there's a change. And, uh, and that's more of a compelling reason to continue with such a product uh, compared to uh, areas that are affected by uh, microbial contamination, where consumers, even when they're using the, uh, the, such a product, there isn't a big difference in the taste or look or, of, of the water. So the way forward for Folia would be to identify areas in the market where uh, there, there's heavy iron contamination and heavily market the product and promote the product in those areas to uh, onboard a uh, large number of uh, consumers. So uh, positioning the product uh, as uh, leading, uh, as a product that addresses iron uh, contamination is, is going to be very important for Folia. And then uh, the retail network also needs to be uh, expanded. Uh, what we saw in the post uh, pilot monitoring is that uh, a lot of the consumers did not have easy access to the products because the retailers that were uh, brought on board to sell the product, uh, they were in the main market centers in the rural areas, uh, quite a bit distance away from rural uh, 
certain rural villages. So uh, if the network is expanded, uh, the product would come into easy reach of the rural uh, households, and that would also influence the sale. And uh, behavioral change communication has to be an important part of the uh, marketing uh, strategy uh, because changing perceptions on issues such as microbial contamination, uh, it will, would require uh, sensitization, orientation, and education of the potential customers, target customers. And uh, in addition to uh, targeting rural households, uh, what Folia can also do is um, target institutionals, local schools uh, in, the, in the areas they are selling their product or factories. Uh, because uh, adolescents who are living in the community are attending the schools, if they uh, use the products uh, in, in, in the school, there's a good chance of them going back to their homes, influencing their parents to adopt such a product for their household use. And same goes for the factories, as local people are, are working in the factories, they use the product, they see uh, the difference, the quality of the treated water, and they may adopt it as well for their personal use in the home. So uh, these are some of the thoughts uh, uh, that have uh, come after the pilot, and uh, the next step also includes uh, sitting down with Folia, designing a detailed uh, study uh, comprising of uh, key informant interviews and focus group discussions um, uh, to understand uh, why people are purchasing it and why they're not purchasing it and based on that formulate the upcoming uh, marketing strategy uh, and uh, decide on the uh, way forward. And uh, that's uh, all from my end and looking forward to the questions uh, from you. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Asfak, and thanks so much also to Keith and to Dennis for your awesome presentation. So what we would like to do now, we actually have um, a bit of uh, extra time for the Q&A, which is great. Um, so we basically uh, have been working behind the scenes to pull all of your questions together. Um, if you have additional questions, please continue to populate them in the chat box, um, and we will start with, we have about, um, five or six uh, for Dennis. Um, we'll switch over to the same number for Ashfaq, and if we have more time, then we'll address some additional questions. Um, so I think maybe it might make sense for um, you, Dennis, to come on, on camera, and we will um, direct the questions at this point to you. Excellent, great. Um, so as mentioned, we have about five or six questions um, on your presentation, lots more, but we're trying to sort of select to see which ones were sort of the most um, universal and, and, and kind of touched and com combine some of the questions. So the first one is uh, from Shahina to you, is um, how to measure the sustainable change in terms of improved livelihood of the smallholder farmers with the engagement of the private sector in your activity? So how are basically, are, how are people's lives better because of the work that you're doing? Yeah, good good, good question. I, I think uh, to begin with, uh, by design, uh, we are working with the range of private enterprises that are already positioned in the communities. And uh, our entry point is an assessment of the needs, uh, in this case, for animal source foods consumption. Uh, and so working with the private sector to respond to these needs, the case I provided earlier is a case of uh, smaller cards that are provided at the service or at the market actor level, that if they are slaughtering chicken, they are conscious of the market demand for the product and prepare products suited to the local capacity to purchase. Uh, as well as uh, working towards understanding what sort of perceptions people have around the product. That way, as a market actor uh, tailors their product to respond to a need that they understand better, they are more likely to be sustainable as a business. They are also, uh, in terms of a relationship, they are able to understand the client's needs, in which case the client uh, 
uh, who has to make a consumption decision, has to make a purchase decision, uh, feels, uh, uh, you know, their demands or their needs uh, responded or addressed to. So I would say sustainability is both ways uh, on the part of the business uh, to fully uh, work towards uh, its uh, full scale of performance, but also at the consumer end, to be sure the right product is being delivered at the right cost and in the right location. I would say those, those are aspects that speak to sustainability more broadly in the ASF market. Yeah, and I think that makes a lot of sense because basically, ultimately, a lot of the work that we do to engage the sector, the private sector, is is for what you just named. It's both for businesses as well as for consumers. Um, so it's it's a, it's it's really interesting to see how your activity is doing that explicitly. Um, another question that came in is from Emmanuel, um, who wanted to know is um, how access to finance for the rural was able to drive rural-based interventions for the ASF. So again, mm. you know, mm. increased access to finance. Uh, mm. What is the connection directly to the increased um, access to uh, the animal source foods? So, uh, I mean, in in our case, uh, uh, for rural enterprises to be able to drive these interventions, they certainly are underprivileged in many ways. They have very limited access to finance, limited access to basic infrastructure, uh, expertise or knowledge in the food sector. So these are natural kind of barriers uh, for them to be successful. And the fact that they operate rural where people have very limited resources to purchase and so forth is makes it even worse. So uh, we have made it easier in the sense of initially I, identifying those who are willing, who have deployed some minimum capacity to respond to the issue and have given them small grants. So uh, in-kind grants or some uh, fixed amount awards for them to work towards the next level. Like the case of Gifileo, you saw, they have been able to purchase very basic uh, cutting equipment, uh, you know, freezing kind of, uh, uh, supplies, you know, they are able to keep their chicken as soon as they have slaughtered it, so it doesn't go bad, but they are also able uh, to transport to different locations uh, through the deployment of a, a coal truck. So it means uh, in addition to supplying local businesses, they can also supply a little further away uh, so that their business is anchored to some sort of commercial model that allows them to survive. So. These, there have to be incentives that are, uh, you know, integrated into the approach for these rural businesses to feel motivated. Thank you. You know, it's interesting, you just ended on the incentives, um, and there was actually a very specific question that came in around financial incentives um, for the rural retailers, right? So before the, the question was more about um, mm. access to finance for, um, both for the the sellers, uh, the, the the small businesses, mm -hmm. but I think um, I guess if there's anything else you wanted to add around any other things that you the schemes that were uh, that were offered to basically foster yeah. this ease of access. If there's anything else yeah. you'd like to add on that? Yeah, sure. So uh, I mean, we we have been very intentional uh, in terms of uh, how these incentives have been structured. First. Uh, they are targeted towards a, a known set of actors uh, in a rural setting, and uh, and they can uh, apply through our uh, request for applications, or they are working with our field facilitators to co-design activities uh, based on their existing enterprises to co-design activities that actually respond to a specific need. So we have a combination of the knowledge of what the specific constraints are for consumption and are working with these enterprises to respond. And we are able to structure these incentives to basically respond to these uh, problems. And naturally, the businesses who are uh, oriented or who have the will in this case and uh, some capacity to work towards responding to this problem benefit from this package, either through the RFA or through uh, some co-creation uh, with our field managers. So it's very intentional uh, for these incentives. So I think that's 
I think that's really interesting. The other question that came in that is um, a bit different, um, not just on the financing, but actually on the infrastructure of the project. So a question came in from Roberta around whether or not the project provided freezers and other cold, cold storage, um, or did you help finance them? Could you talk a little bit about um, the, the cold storage? Yeah, uh, in the animal source food sector, uh, there are certain unique constraints. And in this case, uh, cold storage kind of infrastructure, both at location and uh, some mobile kind of infrastructure is very critical. And uh, in this case of Gifleo, we have provided support in kind at two levels. Uh, there is the holding freezers that you just saw in the video but there's also a transportation truck. So the freezers on location will facilitate uh, the buyers who come to the site because this is a rural-based enterprise. On the other hand, the mobile truck will be able to move between the slaughterhouse at Jefileo to uh, you know, restaurants, supermarkets, uh, a little further away in, a, in, a, in an urban setting. So it allows the business to be focused on both supplying a need locally for smaller pieces, but also doing the same further away from the location of the business. So yes, these have been provided in kind uh, uh, by the project. Oh, you know, I think that's that's like a great example of what we I feel like often refer to as like a win-win, right? So you're building. Um, local local markets and local supply chains, but then you're also enabling the producers to be able to supply into a bit longer supply chains um, with the support both around the storage and the transportation um, into cities and that other market. Um, you know, so you've, you've named a, a number of things that have been challenges that you all have been, as you said, very intentional about supporting. So you've talked about you know, constraints um, on access to finance, um, really understanding the constraints on consumption, really thinking about the, the constraints around cold storage. Um, this question from Fatou is, uh, is asking about, based on your experience, maybe more broadly, um, maybe using ex um, examples from this project, but also kind of more broadly from your experience, um, what are the main constraints in engaging the private sector in rural agricultural development activities? Well, I, I have to say uh, a lot of uh, the private sector that are involved in this business are quite frankly very informal businesses, uh, not a very high level of education, which means the level of expertise is quite low, and they are dealing with a, a, a perishable, highly perishable a food product. And uh, this, this is a major constraint, working with the private sector who are in this space, because the competition on the other hand end deals with the, uh, you know, uh, things that are easier to handle, uh, easier to move around, uh, compared to these animal source foods. So this makes it a lot easier uh, that the terms of participation are even made more difficult. As I said, uh, food quality expectations are very high if you're dealing with a food product. That also means that uh, we have had to deploy uh, various expertise from the business management uh, towards more of the quality management of the food so that the food they produce is safe for the consumers there is a level of knowledge we must build with the actor to not just acquire the equipment, but also be able to use and work with the product in itself uh, on the shelf, uh, in this case, in the freezer, uh, and also the handling so that they can reduce the, the risk of contamination. Uh, but as I said, uh, constraints related to finance uh, are in naturally uh, across the board, uh, these apply into the rural enterprises, but more uniquely, these that speak to the nature of ASF businesses are more complex. You know, it's it's uh, excellent. And um, the final question, at least for this section right now, is from Modibo. And um, they asked, uh, they noted, thank you for the great presentation, which I would uh, concur with. And 
there were some questions about do you have any cases of failure and what are your lessons learned? And I think um, going off what you were just talking about, that you are working with highly perishable foods, um, I'm sure you guys have a lot of lessons learned. Um, it's always is uh, good to talk about things that have worked, um, but also things that haven't worked as well. So if you wouldn't mind sharing um, an example of something that hasn't worked as well and what you all have learned from that. I think uh, across the board, uh, I mean, our, our goal is not necessarily to be super successful. Uh, our goal is to work with these businesses uh, to kind of test out solutions that are practical, that uh, can be scalable, and sometimes it starts from failing. Uh, so we, we've, in, a, in our case, uh, starting out, uh, it, it wasn't that easy because you have to map these enterprises, you have to weigh their level of knowledge and align it to the sector constraints in this case. That has been a major uh, kind of barrier entering into this space and working uh, towards our project kind of goals to quickly scale uh, in terms of the investments, in terms of the number of people we can reach. That in itself is quite a difficult part, that uh, you are aligning the businesses to the goal, uh, you know, understanding that they are able to improve access, availability, and uh, working with the consumer perceptions. Uh, so in uh, each of the businesses comes in uh, with the interest largely to benefit from, say, the expertise and sometimes the grants, uh, but they are not always uh, ready for the level of investment that is required. So many times we have found that there is so much more than we have provided. So the businesses are required to kind of put in more. Uh, but maybe more broadly speaking, outside of the product itself, we've had a range of other businesses that have worked in, uh, say, the animal source food production, uh, those that uh, supply uh, the guys who prepare the product into the market. We piloted an activity with the uh, uh, an anchor kind of actor who was trying to build an outgrower model. Uh, and this is uh, completely from a production perspective. Uh, now, this outgrower uh, did a fantastic job identifying willing actors, engaging with them, providing them input loans, and they did a great job growing the chicken to 40, 42 days, which is the time at which they are able to sell them into the market. But at the point of marketing, the market wasn't ready. You know, COVID hit us and, uh, you know, issues of cold chain were not exactly ready to support this actor. And in the end, uh, the market actor had to sell at a loss, which then means they don't have the ability to go back to work with these outgrowers to continue to grow as uh, based on the timeline. So this, this, this is the kind of challenge that we face, that while the business model is, uh, positioned as quite positive, very promising, the market side might be a disappointing factor. So it talks to our uh, requirement to work across the two ends, production and consumption at the same time. So what I'm saying is the, the market is generally uh, has good demand, but this demand must be facilitated by a number of uh, factors in between all of these supporting factors of the cold chain, of the policy, uh, and, and, and the financing arrangements for this to be successful. So it's, it's not always a perfect uh, kind of situation, but yes, we have seen uh, some, but these have been lessons for us. So we don't necessarily treat it as a failure, but more lessons uh, for future uh, engagement. Exactly, and I feel like that in addition to the things that you were talking about, how you need to have it in line and in place, cold chain, policy, financing, as you as you all really consider, it's also the demand, demand from consumers. It's really about, you know, folks when they go to the market saying, I'm interested in purchasing this and then creating products. I thought it was really powerful in the video for the woman to say, you know, I used to have to buy the whole chicken and now I'm able, um, the, the, the market is now meeting my demand to be able to purchase um, the amount that I need at this time and the amount I can afford. Um, so it was really excellent and great progress. 
Um, thank you very much, Dennis. I think um, what we'll do now is we'll switch over to about five or six questions uh, for Ashfaq, and then I think we should have a bit more time. The webinar actually runs until about 11.30. So I think uh, we'll go to the second round of questions, and then I think we'll bring you guys both on to have a, a, some other additional questions as time allows. Um, so thank you, Dennis. Thank you. Thank you. Great, thanks, Ashfaq, and thank you again for your excellent presentation. Um, there are a number of really interesting questions. People are really uh, curious to know a lot about things related to your project. So the first question that came up was, um, is there a taste factor related to the filter water? So is there an improved taste? Um, is there a less improved taste? And um, in addition to just how the water tastes, if you could talk a bit about um, consumer preference for either the filtered or the unfiltered water. Um, that would be really helpful to start. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, when it comes to um, addressing iron contamination, there is a, there's a taste difference um, uh, in, the water, in the treated water uh, as, as opposed to the untreated water. So that is where uh, consumers immediately notice the difference. But when it comes to addressing microbial contamination, uh, uh, there isn't any taste difference or visible difference in the water. And that's one of the challenges. And this is the scenario in the market that uh, iron contamination uh, is not you know, widespread. These, these problems are in different pockets. So even in the same sub-district, a particular location will not, uh, will, uh, you know, will not have iron contamination, and and the neighboring sub uh, you know, neighboring uh, area would have uh, this problem. So, what Folia was doing is that as they were selling the product to their retail network, uh, you know, not all the consumers were realizing the urgency or uh, or the need to adopt such a product. Uh, sales were really great in in places uh, where there is iron contamination, where consumers are. You know, see the difference in taste. So mm -hmm. they were they were adopting it at a much better rate compared to uh, areas where there were only microbial contamination. Um, thank you. That's really helpful. I think um, that so the next question that came in is related to um, a question of uh, options or. Uh, or reducing contamination at the source, right? I think I'm sure you guys have thought about it. It's not just a matter of, of reducing contamination, um, basically free consumer, but is there any way to reduce the contamination at the source? If you could talk a bit about that, that would be helpful. Right, uh, so we are trying, uh, we are working in three different areas, uh, you know, point of use solutions, then we are also part, uh, you know, working, uh, partnering with companies uh, who are, uh, setting up local water treatment facilities, you know, small water treatment plants. And then uh, we are also working on improving uh, uh, the most widely used uh, source of water, which is the tube well. And this is by far uh, the largest, the most uh, common uh, source of water for rural households, the boreholes. And uh, what we are doing there is uh, one of the main constraints is that uh, when these tubules are set up, the base is not, uh, it's left, uh, uh, it's not, it's not a concrete base that is set up. So as it, it leads to, you know, uh, contamination. Uh, so uh, what we are promoting is a very simple low cost solution so that the base is concrete and uh, it's more hygienic. And uh, so the water uh, drawn from the, from the tubules are not, uh, uh, do not get contaminated uh, as they come into contact uh, with the, with the other uh, you know uh, water jugs and so that's the, uh, the that's what we are promoting uh, in terms of uh, uh, treating the water uh, at the source and uh, we are also uh, in recent uh, discussion with uh, Department of Public Health and Engineering, engineering uh, who is mainly responsible for the distribution of water. Uh, uh, so in the urban, rural areas, they have just started to uh, work on solutions uh, for supplying pipe water. And, uh, and this is something, again, very new for rural uh, communities. So we are planning to work with uh, DPHE, the Department of Public Health Engineering, to 
uh, raise awareness and uh, help the rural communities to adopt such solutions, uh, invest in uh, setting up uh, the pipes and uh, making sure uh, the treated water uh, get, gets access uh, to their homes. Uh, so, so the, through those kind of uh, initiatives, we are we are trying to promote this. Thank you. So that that to some degree leads into the next question, which who is from um, Anahit. Um, so you had mentioned working with um, you had said public health engineering. Um, there is a, a question about um, have you all considered messaging the benefits, perhaps utilizing case studies of filtering for households that have younger children who have experienced sickness um, from contaminated water. And so I was, I guess it's sort of a two part question is, is one, have you all considered messaging the benefits of filtering? And then if so, have you worked with other public health entities? Have you worked with civil society? Have you, you know, worked with, in this case with the private sector? Who have been your partners um, around messaging? Right. Uh that's one of the core components uh, of uh, uh, you know our work when it comes to sensitizing orienting the target consumers we do bring forward the the health benefits of a, of a particular solution that that is being promoted so uh, when it comes to safe drinking water uh, what are the you know health impact the cost impact mm -hmm. of drinking untreated water uh, how much uh, people get sick and how much do they end up spending on doctors on hospitals and you know uh, what what what's their you know total cost uh, throughout the year compared to you know how much they can spend on a solution an affordable solution and and so we always are highlighting the cost benefit uh, through the in the courtyard sessions uh, in the community interactions that take place this is a key component of the marketing or the demand generation activity and uh, we so far we have been uh, uh, we mainly work with the private companies uh, who are you know, offering such solutions and uh, we are also uh, in uh, so we have been in touch with the department of public health engineering but in recent times we are focusing on intensifying that collaboration uh, you know, through joint planning and then uh, jointly implementing. Uh, in terms of civil societies, uh, uh, no, we have not uh, really uh, worked with any. Uh, SBC behavioral change activities is also a core component of our project and uh, through cross-cutting interventions or uh, mainstream interventions in the result areas, uh, we are basically uh, working with the communities directly uh, by ourselves. Thank you for that. Um, so a question came in. Um, these, these next two questions. There's two more questions in this in this section. We'll bring um, you and Dennis together um, before we wrap up. So the last two questions are more about your all's engagement with the private sector. Um, so less on the technical work, but kind of how you work with the private sector. Uh, so this first question is: Is do, does the private sector or do private sector enterprises put in their own capital, um, or is this grant? Are these grants from USAID or is it a bit of blended finance? If you could talk about some of the mechanics of, of working with the private sector in this activity. Right. Uh, in Bangladesh nutrition activity, we are mainly collaborating, partnering with private sector through grants, where uh, for any sort of collaboration, uh, there has to be a financial contribution uh, from the grantee as well. Uh, there are also certain other, uh, uh, you know, clauses that uh, from the activity we do not invest in infrastructure. So, uh, you know, in other interventions where we are working with a company who is setting up local water treatment uh, plants, small water treatment plants, uh, setting up the plant is is uh, their own investment. We are assisting the company in demand generation uh, uh, and marketing activities. Uh, with Folia, uh, the example we just shared, uh, uh, they have the filters, uh, they invested in setting up the distribution network and the retail network, they invested in training the retailers, and they also cost shared in the 
demand generation campaign that got launched. Uh, and of course, uh, you know, from our end, um, the contribution it goes beyond just financial investment. We also help these companies to uh, understand the market through research and study. And we also help them to put together uh, marketing strategies because uh, the rural market scenario differs vastly from the urban uh, areas. So uh, this is where we also provide inputs. Thank you. So that last point leads very nicely into our last question uh, for this section. Um, so this last question is from Casito. Um, and the question is, how did the private sector manage to extend its network to rural areas, as you had just talked about? How was the cost impacted with the increased reach and distribution to outlying areas? You, you talked to, started talking about it a little bit, but I think it would be helpful for you to elaborate a bit. Thank you. Right. Uh, so, for, first of all, they were not selling in the rural market, the rural areas. So, what they needed to do is uh, onboard distributors who would be able to take their products uh, to these uh, uh, rural areas. And uh, the distributors only take it to a certain point, and the retailers also need to be onboarded. Uh, so, so Folia had to get in touch with regional distributors as well as local retailers in order to ensure that the product is available uh, in rural areas, uh, you know, uh, at, the, at the local stores, you know, countertop. Uh, and that requires uh, some investment uh, in terms of, you know, uh, contracting uh, with, the, with the distributors, uh, training the retailers, merchandising, uh, you know, marketing, uh, when you are onboarding the retailers, you also have to spend on IEC materials, information education and communication materials to for marketing the product. So that is how usually, uh, you know, a company such as Folia goes into the rural areas. And of course, it's not also enough to just make the product available. There needs to be marketing as well so that uh, and household consumers are aware that such a product has come to the market, and that's where the market campaigns and the demand generation campaigns come in. Thank you. Um, so I think we have so we have time for two last questions. Um, Dennis, if you could come on camera as well, I think this both of these questions are directed to both of you. So we might we have. Um, about 15 minutes left before the top of the hour. So I think we might be able to just have a bit of a conversation. Um, I'll pose these questions and then I think whoever would like to answer first um, can, can go ahead. Um, so this next uh, question is from Russ. And the question is, is could you describe in more detail how you've approached attracting private capital to help finance these technologies? And what have you been your successes of challenge? And I think both of you have talked about this quite a bit. I think, in fact, Ashfaq, your last point around demand generation is a really critical one. Um, but if there's anything else either you or Dennis would like to just talk about around attracting private capital, um, and it's not just private capital during the course of your activities, but what do you guys think um, is the long-term outlook for attracting private capital um, beyond the, the donor-funded activities? And then what have been your excesses or successes or challenges? So over to one or both of you. Thank you. Yeah, maybe I, I, I will start. Uh, so in our case, uh, we we actually are working with the, it's intentional that we are working with the financial institutions to be fully integrated into the understanding of the market situation and the opportunities that uh, we have uh, highlighted. Uh, we started off with a thorough mapping of the opportunities within the ASF sector and identified key actors among which are the financial service actors uh, to basically have the feel of what the opportunity across the board from production to the existing market infrastructure all through to how uh, investments are being made so they can understand better uh, the structure of those investments. And so we have partnerships at two levels. One, the microfinance institutions and the savings and credit cooperatives, which largely operate uh, in a rural setting 
and work very well with the uh, private uh, kind of smaller companies. Um, on the second level, we have actors, uh, in this case, uh, the commercial banks, who, whose targeting is actually a little higher level and they need to be oriented better to appreciate uh, businesses in the rural setting and their unique constraints. Uh, in our setting as well, these are food businesses dependent on seasonality of produce uh, and uh, several other factors. So investment into that space uh, really uh, takes a knowledgeable uh, actor in terms of the financial actors. So we've been intentional on uh, mobilizing these two levels uh, to both understand the gap in financing and the struggle that businesses have to go through to achieve a level of scale that satisfies the market, uh, but also uh, to kind of have uh, their, the capacity within the team, the different institutions, both at the microfinance and the commercial banks, to fully appreciate uh, the knowledge gaps uh, at the appraisal of the loan applications or at uh, just the determination of what is required in terms of collateral, for these people to be able to access finance, sometimes it's just cast in stone and they are not necessarily tailored to address the needs of these businesses. So that is uh, quite a challenge in mobilizing uh, access to capital. And so we are intentional on working with these businesses uh, to be able to uh, understand the need and uh, to fund these particular businesses. Thank you, Dennis. Um, um, Ashfaq, do you have um, anything you would like to add around attracting private capital um, to help finance technologies? Anything else that you would like to add on? Uh, sure. Uh, what I would add uh, from the context of Bangladesh is that uh, what we see is that the company has to have uh, the right product and uh, the incentive to mar market it to rural consumers. Uh, for example, water filters for safe drinking water are mar marketed by uh, big companies such as Unilever, but those, those products are expensive and uh, they are mainly marketed to urban consumers. So, and uh, keeping, keeping the affordability uh, of rural consumers, uh, uh, Unilever or some big FMCGs have not really uh, developed uh, a solution as of yet. Uh, so, so, so that's where you know Polia's uh, solution came in. That it's it, it's low cost and it's uh, within the affordability of a, of a rural household. Challenge for Polia is to you know address the uh, repeat purchase and you know uh, the retail network. So they saw the market opportunity, the incentive. As a result, they they were willing to invest uh, uh, in other areas of our of our activity, uh, for example, uh, agriculture. Uh, we are not working in the mainstream agricultural sector, but we are promoting homestead farming. And this is not a, a mainstream sector, it's a niche market. So big national companies, uh, uh, renowned companies, uh, are we found that are mostly interested in the commercial sector. Um, that's where their bulk of the business is coming from, not really willing to invest uh, resources uh, uh, on homes uh, on ho the homestead market uh, whereas small regional companies uh, as they realize that they cannot compete with the big players in the in the commercial sector yet they want to expand their business uh, those are the type of companies who are willing to invest uh, and take their product to uh, rural homestead uh, farmers so it, it has to be uh, uh, the incentive has to be there. It has to uh, the uh, it has to align with the business model, and uh, uh, only then uh, you know partners uh, would be willing to uh, cost share and uh, you know take a product or solution to this particular uh, target group. And of course, what De what Dennis was uh, mentioning regarding financing uh, that is uh, uh, you know very valid. Uh, something uh, we are also we also have started to look into uh, because uh, you know 
funding is a, is a constraint for uh, many businesses. So since from our project, we are not directly financing uh, businesses, uh, we are looking into how to connect them with financial institutions or you know, microfinance institutions to ensure that uh, they have the fund needed to take their product to this particular target consumers. Thank you. Great, thanks to you both. Um, we do have one final question and uh, just under 10 minutes left. Um, so this last question is, uh, what impact are current inflationary pressures having on consumer demand uh, for both of your areas of products in your countries and the ability of firms to supply these products that match reduced purchasing power of households? Um, maybe, yeah, whoever mm -hmm. would like to start first. Uh, maybe, yep, Dennis, there you are. Definitely start with you, and then we'll take the last minutes and wrap it up with Ashbox. Over to you. Yeah, thank you. I, I think to begin with, uh, uh, even before this kind of level of inflation, we have identified a major constraint uh, in the increasing demand for animal source foods uh, to be uh, beyond the facts, uh, fact of uh, being available. Uh, there is the issue of the purchasing power of the consumers. Uh, in 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 a in the sense that in any case uh, in the rural sector they are largely dependent on uh, farming and very few have off farm kind of jobs uh, to raise a significant income to kind of uh, opt for a diversified diet and uh, for the most time when they are exposed to a choice uh, they do not necessarily choose ASF. They know the importance, but they don't necessarily choose for issues around the cost uh, and maybe issues around the packaging and so forth. Now, with the, this uh, level of inflation, uh, it puts a significant pressure on the household and to an already kind of damaged situation where they are still being encouraged to make the right decision uh, to purchase uh, animal source foods. So I would say uh, in terms of building consumer demand, it might be early stage. Uh, we have not fully uh, uh, observed this change as we go, but what we realize is uh, from the ongoing social behavior change, communication messages, the small investments that are happening at the community, the, the, the producers, uh, rather the consumers are open uh, to increase their volume of purchased product. Uh, however, with this situation, there is likely going to be a direct effect to those households that in any case were struggling. Uh, and this puts a challenge even further to the processors, uh, the people who, who are supplying this product in the market. It gets even more difficult in terms of the infrastructure they have been investing, the cost of fuel is up, the cost of uh, inputs around animal production is up, and naturally the cost of the products is high. So it certainly tells you we are going to experience a situation where the choice is even made more difficult uh, for, for consumers uh, to purchase animal source foods product. Thank you. Thank you, and I think um, for our last few minutes, Ashak, I'll have you um, add your comments in around this point around inflation, reducing or potentially impacting purchasing power, um, and we'll go from there. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Uh, yes, it's uh, it's very relevant to uh, when it comes to adopting diverse nutritious diet, because uh, the most common perception we find among rural households is that in order to eat, uh, you know, nutritious food, they have to spend more. So that's where in our behavioral change communication or community interaction, we are promoting uh, uh, you know, certain type of food groups uh, from leafy green vegetables to uh, other type of food items where we are, try uh, we are uh, you know, sensitizing our target beneficiaries that you don't really have to spend uh, a whole lot uh, in order to consume a uh, diverse, di uh, diverse diet. And then at the same time, we are also uh, promoting 
uh, alternatives that instead of you know purchasing everything from the market you can you can grow a lot of these leafy greens and other type of vegetables in your own home uh, and you, you can you can go for poultry rearing um, uh, which will which will also provide a source of uh, animal protein um, so uh, through basically uh, these mechanisms we are we are trying to uh, you know promote uh, the consumption of nutritious diet given the scenario that costs have gone up and it is influencing consumer uh, purchase behavior. Thank you. Um, thanks to you both. Um, we are going to wrap up. Uh, we are just about on time, so we wanted to end on time today. So I wanted to say thank you again to you, um, Ashfaq, and to you, Dennis. Uh, for presenting both on the Feed the Future Bangladesh Nutrition Activity and the Feed the Future Rwanda Aurora with Hazi Activity. Thanks to everyone for your questions. Um, we've done our best to integrate them. We will collect all of them and we will be able to, uh, the best of our ability, answer them and um, share them in the, in the follow-up materials. We will also be sharing this recording um, and so please be on the lookout for that. Uh, thanks again, and I uh, hope you guys have a wonderful day.